Greetings, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, we are pleased and honored to welcome here Gustavo Montesano, the president of uh, BNDS Bank. Uh, it, we're hearing a lot about Brazil in the news right now, whether it's COVID, whether it's death rates, whether it's the burning of the Pantanal, but largely that misses a lot of the story about Brazil, the positive stories we're hearing about Brazil, about economic growth, about fiscal austerity and a series of reforms that will prove very, very important for the sustainable economic development of Brazil and also the reform of the Bandeira uh, Bank, the Brazilian uh, Development Bank that Gustavo is going to talk about, uh, which of course came out of the boom years of the early 2000s uh, in upheaval uh, and question its commitment to market principles and Gustavo has led it in a new direction and we'll be here to talk about that. But to introduce Gustavo, uh, we have here Hugh Jenkins of BTG Pactual, a friend of Chatham House, one of the main sponsors of the Latin American Initiative, uh, and Hugh, and also a, a large and a real a Brazilian file, if you can, uh, Hugh Jenkins. So Hugh, please uh, take it away. There we go. Chris, thank you very much. And uh, obviously, I'm delighted that uh, I've been able to help arrange for uh, uh, Gustavo Montesano to be here today to talk about uh, BNDS and the Brazilian scene in general. But uh, just a, perhaps a couple of uh, comments of introduction to to uh, uh, put perhaps uh, Mr. Montezano's experience in context. Uh, he's a you know highly qualified uh, economist and engineer, uh, successful analyst in private equity in Brazil for Opportunity, a uh, very successful fund in uh, in Brazil. Uh, but perhaps he got his real education at BTG Pactual, where he got a sort of master's in practical banking and uh, business administration. So uh, Mr. Montezano was was the head of our structured credit uh, and corporate opportunities desk uh, during a time of uh, great, great change in BTG Pactual. And he was able to manage probably the largest restructuring of a loan book uh, with the, the smallest impact on P&L. That I've experienced in my in my banking life of 40 years, so incredibly well qualified, in my opinion, to deal with some of the challenges that are faced in uh, in looking at how to uh, generate returns and uh, and appropriately focus the lending of BNDS on behalf of the Brazilian government and people. Uh, and secondly, a very important thing I think to to comment in terms of uh, Gustavo's experiences, he and I work together very closely as CEO and COO of BTG Pactual's commodity business, which had uh, 36 offices, presence in 16 countries, and he was based here in London for, for three years, uh, and learned, I think, a huge amount uh, about the international marketplace, so dealt with very significant global investors, dealt with a variety of different regulatory environments, and again, was involved in a, in a very significant restructuring where we reduced the workforce by about 70%, uh, reduced the balance sheet by two thirds uh, and improved the return on equity uh, almost almost inf almost uh, to infinity compared to where it was before, I regret to say. So uh, I'm very proud to be his partner. Um, I think he's incredibly well qualified for this task in front of him. Uh, and I should also mention that I think he's, he's a really nice guy and a, and a, and a very, a very uh, uh, deep thinker in terms of the future of his country. And I was I was sad to see him return to take up national service, but uh, honestly, it's exactly how Brazil regenerates by getting international executives like Gustavo to return home. So uh, I'm very pleased he's here today. Gustavo, over to you. Oh, Mr. Jenkins, thank you for the generous and beautiful words. Uh, hello, Sabatini. Hello, everyone that's uh, participating here. Uh, I would say that uh, it's a great honor and a great pleasure to be speaking here at Chatham House. And I hope it's uh, one of many that we can exchange and uh, I would say that uh, I, I would love to hear uh, feedback later. Uh, we'll be speaking here about Brazil, BNDS, development banks. So for us, for, for myself, for BNDS, for the Brazilian government, I uh, will be delighted to take it through Sabatini or through Mr. Jenks. Any thoughts or feedbacks or points of view or, or, or some uh, new ideas that we, we may not touch here. So please send us your, 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 your visions and, uh, and opinions later on. And uh, I'll do a brief introduction here on Hill. I'll start with my kind of personal history for, for a short short period, and then I will jump into BNDS. And when I speak about BNDS, 
you can take some uh, thoughts about uh, development banks globally because it applies to, to our market, the same kind of challenge. And also Brazil, uh, in the IC history, is totally tied to, to Brazil history uh, in the social and economic terms, right? And starting with my, my journey from, from, from Sao Paulo to London, and then to, to, from London to Brazil, what, uh, what uh, we, we were seeing in 2018, 2017, and uh, I had the pleasure to discuss that a lot with Mr. Jenkins, was uh, this cyclical and secular change that was about to happen in Brazil, uh, really, really disruption. And uh, I remember clear when uh, I was there and we saw the Brexit happening and uh, we saw very similar, I would say, signs coming from Brazil. And it was very, very funny because when I flew to Brazil to, to speak with my partners about the possibility of Mr. Bolsonaro being elected, they just laughed at me. And when I come back to London and speak to Mr. Jenkins, he said, no, you're not crazy, it makes total sense. And uh, what uh, I was seeing that could happen in Brazil and is still happening today, I would say with more power than initially thought, was a disruption, right? Firstly, a political disruption that was uh, totally linking, linked to the ma a massive reduction of corruption in Brazil. So that would open up the opportunity for newcomers, for outsiders to join the, our public service, as you said, and uh, uh, with more, uh, I'll say, uh, no corruption culture and uh, having room to work as a technician, as I am. Second, it was a, a very big agenda of reforms that was about to happen and that, that were needed uh, by, 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 uh, for Brazil. And thirdly, was uh, a cultural shift where uh, fighting or finding a more balanced economy between the state, between the government and the, and the, and the private market. As you know, Brazil is very concentrated still today on the private sector, but, uh, but what, there was a big room both coming from the cultural side of the population, but even and also from the, the government that would open up the room for privatization and concessions or any kind of shrinking a movement from, from the government. So based on this view of lowering, massively reducing corruption, uh, agenda of reforms that would change dramatically the way uh, companies and the government works, in the big agenda of privatizations and shrinking the size of the state, I do thought that was a good moment for myself to jump in as a, as a, as a, as a lieutenant on this, on this, on this journey from, from our country. And I have the, I had, I had took the, the tough decision of leaving the beautiful and lovely London that I love, still love today and uh, aiming to visit soon, uh, to move back to Brazil and to help my country. And I can say that uh, two years later, uh, things are moving exactly in the direction that we thought. Uh, but I would say that with much, 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 much powerful and speed that, uh, that, uh, that I initially thought. And that's very funny because when, when I was uh, uh, thinking about moving back to help the government, I, I, I thought that I should be the president, the CEO of BNDS for all my background that you mentioned. It was very interesting, my, my, my first meeting with Mr. Paulo Guedes when I was uh, 37 years old and sitting in front of him in Leblon, Rio de Janeiro, uh, in December 2017, as telling him that uh, I should be the president of BNDS. He thought that I would be a little bit aggressive or ambitious, but I know that with all my background experience in, in, in investments, in corporate marketing, restructuring, it was a place to be. And for any other uh, reason it happened, but in, in not in the first moment, I, I joined the bank in June 19. And I, has been I have been here for 18 months. And I, I'm, I'm very pleased to say that uh, things are happening. And uh, we are moving BNDS in the direction that, uh, that, I, learned, that I learned in London, a uh, direction of sustainability, a uh, direction of uh, we should not be measured by financial success only. We should be financial sustainable but uh, with uh, focus on impact, social and environmental. And for me, for me was, uh, was uh, very lucky to be living in London from 16 to 18 and being drinking, I would say, clean waters from the sustainable movement from the beginning. That was really not happening in Brazil yet and having the opportunity to learn that and mimic and understand that how, how could that be impactful for Brazil 
and especially for the development banking is very important for, for my position today. And I'm, I'm very grateful of, of this, this opportunity. And uh, when I joined the bank and in 18 months ago, I found an institution that for this century, for the last 20 years, uh, has been measured and has been uh, directed as I call the lending machine. It being the only solely function was to lend, 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 lend. And the more we lend, uh, uh, more, more, more prosperous it should be. And the more we competed with uh, private banks, uh, uh, the better will be paid. So it was a totally misinterpretation of, or misuse of this uh, huge development bank. Just for, 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 for information, for those that they know, we have today roughly $20 billion of equity book value and the total assets of roughly $150 billion. So it's a huge bank uh, for not for global uh, in global metrics and especially in Brazilian metrics. And if you imagine this uh, giant, this elephant in the room competing with private blanks and with very, very subsidized rates. So it was almost a mono monopoly, uh, the BNDS holding the country. But uh, this was very uh, uh, painful for Brazil and uh, it created a lot of uh, uh, strategical bottlenecks or, or, or misroutes for foreign country. First one was the fiscal one, and I, I cannot, I don't need to tell you, but it, it, it drives the impeachment of Dilma. Uh, it brought our, our fiscal accounts to crazy levels, sorry for the word. Uh, but more important than that, when you go to the private economy, we created, uh, we call the national champions from our, on one side. And from the other side, we avoided the creation of a clear syndication and project finance market in Brazil. We don't have the traditional, or say the street to sense of project finance or syndication market. And this is today a bottleneck to grow our infrastructure. And uh, I'll speak more about, about, more about that later. And on top of that, we, uh, I found a bank with 120 billion reais or $25 billion of uh, uh, equity portfolio. The daily value of BNDS was $1 billion, $1 billion a day of equity speculative VAR. It's total insane for, for a development bank. What we have been doing since then was basically shrinking the size of this equity book portfolio. Uh, to, we, 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 we're targeting a, a virtually zero uh, speculative portfolio uh, just because it's not the purpose of development bank. We should be here to create jobs, to improve social conditions, to improve education, uh, 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 sustainable environmental uh, uh, actions, not to be speculating the market. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a decent uh, uh, function, but it's not for a, for a public bank. Second, we, we have been paying back uh, the treasury. Uh, we still have today 200 billion reais of outstanding loans with the treasury. And uh, as soon as we, when we end the calamity period, period, which should take place in December, now 31st, we, we get back to our, uh, to our uh, repayment schedule to the Treasury. So our agreement with uh, the minister and with the Treasury is that we should pay until December 2022 more 160 billion reais. So if you average that just as, as an average, will be 80 billion for the next two years, right? And uh, we should retake place that in the, in the, in the upcoming year. On the other hand, on the, let's say, the, the going forward agenda, we've been working a lot on privatizations and concessions. Uh, in the last 18 months, we put up in place what I think is the largest investment bank in Brazil uh, per capita basis, but uh, we serve the Brazilian government. Our client here are the ministers, all the ministers, and uh, the Brazilian states. And I can tell you that this business, uh, which is a kind of venture business within BNDS because it's quite new, it's moving, it's moving very, very well. Uh, I'm impressed with the amount of assets that the government has in their hands, in our hands, and we even don't know. And the more we dig with our clients, find assets, we see that we can see that this business is a long-standing business for BNDS. It's not just a 2022 um, uh, mandate, so it's, a, it's a perpetual business. Uh, just for example, we have today 100, 100 mandates. And uh, if you see the, the CAPEX under these mandates, it's roughly 200 billion reais of CAPEX. So it's a massive, it's a massive business. And uh, we don't take more mandates as of today because it just don't have capacity. 
and um, our investment bank it's not totally uh, perfect the, the analogy but our investment bank has almost 200 people so just to see the size and the potential of this massive uh, uh, selling or concession or privatization program both at the federal level but also at states and municipal levels right and on the other hand a very important and relevant going forward agenda is all the ESG, especially the green agenda for Brazil. Uh, we had to step back a little bit during the, the COVID crisis for, for, for obvious reasons, uh, but uh, we do see that uh, uh, Brazil has all the features and all the tools to be a leading, a leading player on the green finance agenda, right? We are one of the largest democracies in the, in the world. We have a very deep and very robust and creative financial markets and we have the largest natural capital in the world. When I look at all those in ingredients and when I see the how transforming and how disruptive is this new green finance, we are all learning together how to deal with that. But when I see all the ingredients, I do see that Brazil should be leading this agenda uh, with financial products, with new idea, funds, vehicles, etc. all the good stuff that the, the financial community create, create for us. And naturally we as a development bank we should be leading uh, this agenda, right? And on the more traditional part of the bank, on the more, say, uh, incumbent business, on the financing side, if I have to summarize our goal there, is especially open up the infrastructure marketing. As I mentioned before, create a syndication market, a syndication industry in Brazil, where we can, we do, we can take true project finance risk. And it, it doesn't happen in Brazil, it doesn't exist. Everything is based on standby letter of credits or corporate guarantees. And if you go to Chile, Mexico, Peru, Colombia, it's happening there. It's not just thinking about uh, Europe or US. Our Latin America co colleagues, they do have that. And just be, you know, was not developed in Brazil because BNDS was the elephant in the room avoiding that. And uh, 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 all these, uh, I would say, strategic guidelines that uh, I mentioned here for BNDS they, they apply for, 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 for development banks worldwide. And for me, it was very interesting when I, when I start dealing with, that international, with those international peers uh, in the IMF and Financing Common Summit, all the global meetings that we have with BRICS and banks. And uh, uh, since uh, we joined the bank, it was very clear this agenda that was established by the minister during the campaign. So we're basically here executing the strategic agenda that Mr. Paulo Guedes set for the bank since 2018. Of course, with much more detail of execution, but the conceptually, conceptually, this was the agenda. And when was when I discussed that with my with my Chinese peers, French peers, uh, Indian peers, we are all on the same agenda, completely changing the way development banks they are looked, completely completely changing the way we are measured uh, as a success banks. For many years, uh, those banks that have been, they, they've been focused only on the financial uh, measures. So more loans, more developments, more profits, more social benefits, and it's not, not true. So there's a global trend of changing and moving those development banks to a more collaborative, collaborative approach, because as of today, does the, the, the not lack capital in the world. We are looking for impact, you have enough capital. So we should be working as a catalyst, as someone that's leading the government alongside of the market in those new taxonomy or regulations or new trends for the social environmental impacts and trying to uh, conglomerate and catalyze private money for that. And uh, I can tell or think that uh, we are kind of one of the leading institutions on, on, on this agenda. And uh, the world is, is clearly watching BNDS steps and seeing how, how are, are you performing. So that's, that's uh, roughly the, the strategic view of the bank. I, I think it's moving quite well. I'm impressed of, uh, with the speed that the things has, has been, uh, uh, being, I would say, accepted by, by the market. Naturally, a lot of the challenges on the, on the public side, bureaucracy, governance, corporations, like uh, uh, protections for the, of the, of the uh, public animal itself, but it's moving well. And a very good example of this, I can tell was how how efficient or how decisive we were on the COVID crisis. Uh, we've been working a lot in the last nine months, very, very hard work, 
But uh, when I look backwards with all the, the, the challenge and, and the fear, and I think that's the most, the best word, the fear that you all had. And what we can, I can say that uh, BNDS delivered in this crisis something fantastic. And the good side of this that is that the crisis speeded up our strategy because everything that we put in place in the last year was kind of preparing the bank for this more agile and collaborative approach. And uh, in this crisis, I would highlight two main actions that we took that were decisive. And I can mention more, but uh, just highlight two. The first big action and very difficult one was what not to do. Uh, for all the things that I mentioned, uh, the, the, the government and especially BNDS was known for by helping uh, big corporations, helping the large corporations. That was the business of BNDS. And when the crisis, the crisis starts, our minister who was very clear, who was very clear and very thoughtful as he is. Uh, let's, let's leave the big guys for the private markets, private banks, capital markets. Let's focus on the small ones, small business. And uh, it was a complete change of BNDS way of doing business, right? Not only the operational side, but more important, the, the philosophical side. So we were very, very criticized by the market, very criticized, even from the private players, of course, as you can imagine, uh, by the media. But uh, we, we, stick, we stick to our plans, right? And they proved it to be a success because then the, the private banks, they stepped in. And if you see just on April, the, the, the total loan portfolio in central bank data of private banks to large corporate, of total banks to large corporate, increased from 900 billion reais to 1 trillion. So it was like 100 billion reais in one month. It's crazy. It's insane. All to large corporate. And then after that, we saw a very intensive capital markets activity in the year. And at, at we end 2020 as the second, as the best year in capital markets, equity capital markets in Brazil since 2007, right? And the WBNDS had a, a very good participation there as well. So the strategy of leaving the big boys for the, the private market was a tough position to be, to be bet, uh, political, mediatic, but uh, we stick and it, it worked quite well. And uh, the most uh, icon example of this was the airline companies, where we decided of, to go through a market solution route. We offered our funds, our, private, our BNDS funds for the three airlines in Brazil, Latam, Go, and Azul through a convertible. And I must tell here, it was not a cheap deal. The guys were paying some price, but we should be seen as a less resource money, especially when, when you are helping investors and not only the service, the company. And at the, at the end of the day, all the companies, they found uh, 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 private solutions, either to chapter 11, either through a private convertible deal or just dealing with suppliers and, and, and lenders as Go did. So none of them took our monies. And today you have planes flying Brazil, markets returning. They are the highest, highest stock price since the COVID started. So we're very happy with this outcome. We did our job. And uh, we think that was a very good cultural shift and example for the Brazilian market that uh, we should be focusing on the, on the small, small and medium, medium companies, right? I can say the same for the automobile companies where they, they pushed us a lot, but uh, we stuck it to the plan and uh, now they are they're happy with the, the outcome. And then trying 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 to move a, a bank that was that was always focused on the big big funds, big company to the SME in Brazil was not an easy task, right? Uh, we have we have a structural issue in Brazil which the which the, the, the credit market for the SME and that's why it's a big opportunity for the financial institutions today. Everyone is moving this, this, this direction because if you see a, a medium company in Brazil, they pay uh, a roughly 20% per year on rates, 20% per year on average. If you take a small business, they pay on average 40% per year on rates. And just remember, we have a 2% sovereign rates in Brazil. So it's very, very expensive for several reasons. So trying to, to bring the money to, to those guys at the last mile was not an easy task. Uh, because of the structural, structural situation in Brazil. And uh, it was very interesting because we, we did a, a benchmark with all the development banks and what were they doing during the crisis. And, uh, and, uh, and uh, we, we noticed that we are doing basically 80% of the same products that they, they use it. But there was one big gap that we're not using. 
and it's very usual, it's very something very usual in UK, in US, very usual, would scratch insurance, like uh, act as insurance instead of a, of a, a prime lender. And uh, why it, it doesn't happen in Brazil? Just because it's a large concentrated market, huge participation of public banks. So no one ever wanted to, to put that in place. And then we click it, oh, that's the solution. So let's put a credit guarantee in place. And there was a very good collective, collective effort with uh, Congress, Minister of Economy, uh, uh, Casa Civil, uh, presidents in Brazil, uh, uh, banks associations. And we put up in place, like in two months, innovative products for the credit insurance that was funded with 20 billion reais uh, with public federal money. And as of today, we lent it, we lent through this channel, uh, nine to, nine to 92 billion reais to SMEs in Brazil. Just for a, a parameter of how relevant, is, how relevant is this, if you take the figures of February, uh, total market from central bank data for SMEs in Brazil was 550 billion reais roughly. In five months, we lent 92 billion through this program. If you add up all the other programs that we participated as BNDS, we lent this year 140 billion reais to SMEs, including all the programs. I just highlighted the credit insurance as the as the as the as the, more, the, the, the most innovative one, the most relevant. But again, uh, looking at the, the size of our participation, 140 against a market as of today that's roughly 700 billion that they grew. We're speaking 20% of the balance, but the, 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 the balance of credit SMEs in Brazil passed through BNDS hands uh, during the last six months. So it was a very, very effective uh, 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 participation, very and quick. And uh, the bank was ready for that just because the last six months we've been preparing the, the machine to work on the on this sense. So, uh, Sabatini, I think that's the big uh, high level picture. I give some big picture about where we're moving on, on the, on the large, uh, I would say most relevant topics. And I, I did a comment about the, the COVID crisis. And I think I, with that, I finished my, my, my start presentation. And for any topic of that, we can speak for four hours here, but that will be my, yeah. my overall introduction. Thank you. Well, let me open it up. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, I want to let Hugh ask a question as the, as the introducer, but first I wanted to, uh, ask a question of my, my own. Um, and it's a question that has two, I won't even say it has two parts, it's two separate questions. The first is, of course, is when I think of BNDSA uh, previously, I think of the distortionary effect it had on credit markets and interest rates. Um, and so I'm curious to what extent, now obviously what you said on the credit insurance is one way to reduce that, but yet still play a supportive role in access to credit but reduce the, the dampening effects of, of uh, access to credit uh, for in the private markets for private set for small businesses. Um, the second question though I have is, is to what extent you are collabor collaborating with the new um, development bank out of Asia, the, the BRICS bank uh, that grew out of obviously was capitalized primarily with Chinese capital, um, has given some funding already uh, for sustainable infrastructure projects in India. Brazil is a member uh, to what extent is BNDS playing a role in that? So two qu questions. The first is correcting, you, know, you use the metaphor of the elephant in the room. Certainly BNDS was the elephant in the credit markets. Um, to what extent have you, you stopped uh, that distortionary effect and then uh, the new development bank? Yeah, it started with NDB. Today we have the pleasure of having Marcos Truijo, which was our former secretary of, of, of international trade as this a friend and a former colleague at Columbia University, I want to say. I know Marcos very yeah. well. Yeah, yeah, Columbia. That's it. Yep. That's good guy. Very good guy. He's now the CEO of NDB. And one of the, his missions is exactly to, to increase in, in, in NDB's participation in Brazil. And uh, we are a natural arm, I would say, of NDB here. Uh, and, uh, and he's been there for four months, I think, uh, or six months. And uh, things are moving. Uh, the uh, Next year, the, the up, upcoming six months, NDB will, will likely put more money in Brazil than ever, adding all the, uh, since its start. So it's a, it's a big push. And uh, one of the key agendas that we have alongside with NDB is all the infrastructure in, in market in Brazil. That's something that interests a lot for us Brazilian, and especially also for the Asians, since it has a lot to do with uh, agribusiness productions, right? All the logistics and stuff uh, uh, behind that. Going to your, your, your first question, 
I can say that uh, uh, the distortion, it, it's almost uh, addressed for the uh, new loans. We, we focus our, our participation today, basically in infrastructure for the, the, the long-term long -term BRL financing, because we still have some gaps for long-term BRL financing in Brazil for some sectors. And we do need BNDS to fulfill those, those gaps. And of course, all is trying to, to bring the, cap, the private market if possible. And the second focus is to address this critical issue of access of capital for the SMEs in Brazil. And uh, it's a structure one. And our agenda is to take more risk at the, at the, at the last mile. And again, we have 100 billion reais of equity in our, in our hands and a 40% base of index, we do have room to take risk. And uh, we, are, we are planning how to do that in the, in the after crisis moment. But that, that, those are our two only credit agenda and very materials. Thank you. There's a question that came up, but I want to see if Hugh had a comment, uh, given your experience and, and long-standing interest in Brazil. Well, firstly, I, I thought it was a, a very good set of comments from from Gustavo, and and particularly the story about the airline is a is a is a very impressive one in sort of changing culture, right, in BNDS. But uh, always, it, always the impression that I have is that the issue for Brazil is is capital expenditure, especially on infrastructure. Um, and we've seen a huge increase in infrastructure bonds this year, Gustavo. And, and how do you see uh, BNDS sort of developing the, the market for investment in infrastructure in Brazil? What are the key, the key uh, elements of your strategy there? Well, since I joined BNDS, it was clear both for the bank and for the previous government that uh, the main bottleneck you have in Brazil are good, are good projects because if you had a good a good project, well model with good sponsors, good regulation, it has been funded, and uh, 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 moving this funding from public money to private money is pushing more and more this agenda of uh, being more having more criteria to fund the projects. Because going backwards, when both the federal government, being the goal was the the size of your check, not trying to be I'd uh, say uh, unfair here. But the quality of the projects was not so relevant. So just let's burst. Moving this now to more private collaboration, uh, uh, the bar level of the quality of the project, and especially with this new, all the new environmental change, is raising, right? So our main bottleneck is to create this pipeline of uh, new projects, and it it takes like uh, two years, four years sometimes to prepare good projects. But when you when you look at this pipeline in Brazil, it is still I would say narrow so we're increasing investing money in this industry to put up this pipeline and uh, when the government comes in 2023 hopefully they can have two three years of pipelines of projects to come to the market what what we're seeing here is that uh, when that's the case uh, there is capital there is capital there is capital uh, available uh, and uh, we uh, we do not see a big bottleneck in the in, let's say few years for funding the project, like, but when you 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 project, like, let's say five, six, seven years, ten years, then we can we may have a a, a gap. Then we, we need to develop a long term BRL based uh, uh, supplies of credit in Brazil. We do need, but again, I'm taking I'm speaking about ten years ahead. And uh, what are what are we doing uh, to 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 support this? Firstly, is trying as I as I mentioned to bring more participants. On the syndication market for project finance and that's a market where international banks they know how to play much more than brazilian and if you look just at the construction phase let's say it's five to seven years you can have hedge so we can play that game with fx risk can be hedged it, it, it pays the cost if you want to hedge for 20 30 years it's just uh, not price non price it doesn't have the price for for executing the hedge and on the other hand we have an agenda and BTG is also involved in, on this uh, uh, first initiative, is trying to create a family of private loan funds for infrastructure in Brazil, credit funds. We do have a bunch of uh, equity, uh, private equity and infrastructure funds, where I would love to have a five, six, seven, ten credit private loan, 20, 30 year BRL available funding for infrastructure. And uh, our, our support on this is to underwrite 20, 25% of each of those funds in order to, to help them uh, raising more capital. So that's the, the, our high level strategy on, the, on this agenda. Thank you. One question we have, and you started to address it, Gustavo, when you talked about 
um, the airlines and other things, but how would you both in terms of the short term uh, addressing issues of COVID and how that has, has recast the NDSA's role uh, and your vision of the reform of the NDS, but also as we've seen globally, not just uh, in emerging markets, but in developed markets as well, uh, the, the economic crisis has shown uh, the, the, the very strong structural weaknesses in the economies, whether it's the informal sector, uh, lack of access to healthcare and the like. To what extent is this recast or uh, reoriented, if you will, BNDS's uh, um, views on its role, if at all? Absolutely, Sab uh, Sabatini. And, and, and uh, uh, since the beginning, uh, we set the agenda that BNDS should be working uh, for the most need, for the poor, for the environment, not just for the big boys that ha they have plenty of money. And uh, the COVID crisis just speed it up, right? It, it revealed a lot of problems, like we have 100 million people without water sanitation in their homes in Brazil. That's a shame, that's ridiculous. When you see a, a small company in Brazil, and when you say, say small, it's a guy that, that uh, has a $1 million revenue per year. It's a small guy in Brazil uh, for, for central bank criteria. They pay on average 40% per year of rates. It's ridiculous. So uh, all those social gaps, I would say, uh, they were revealed and uh, kind of how the elites in Brazil, we got shocked, but uh, it's a good shock, I would say. And looking forward, uh, we may discuss a lot of infrastructure and things here, but the best challenge we have in Brazil is poverty. When I say poverty, it's poverty of sanitation, of education, is a lot to sense of comment. And uh, uh, with all the technology advance that, that, that we may face uh, in the upcoming forever, and uh, all the this mass of unemployed people that may never find a job ever in their life again. And uh, when you look at that, how efficient or non-efficient the Brazilian state is to provide services and attention to those, to this part of the population, uh, I do think that's a big challenge you have. So once we put our heads out of the water in the crisis, I would say that more than ever, uh, our society will be focused on this because uh, we, we, we cannot speak about environment, about long-term growth, about nothing, if you have the social gap, right? And uh, uh, the good part of this is that our our elites, 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 sorry, but uh, the rich people, the educated people in Brazil, uh, they are kind of waking up for that. Thank but you. Uh, go ahead. Um, the um, So there's one, I have another question on that, but I wanna uh, go to a question that we have here and I'm gonna read it out. How does BNDS uh, make decisions on which sectors to prioritize? Is it prospects for growth, securing supply change, chains, and also acknowledging the funds uh, to how to distribute or allocate funds to civic institutions, which is also part of your portfolio, to the Rio Museum and the like. How are those decisions made and how are they shaped and changed over the last couple of years, certainly since your tenure uh, coming on board at BNDS? Yeah, uh, uh, our, our first big uh, target is all the infra market. Yeah. Everything that needs long-term BRL funding, uh, we, we try to address it if the market's not there as a complement. If the market's there, fair enough. I mean, fine, we don't need to participate. But uh, trying to fill the gap of the long-term BRL for infrastructure is a, is a, is a critical uh, uh, function of BNDS. You may see BNDS as an insurance. If someone is trying, wanting to invest in Brazil, and some kind of afraid of not having long-term BRL, we are here to say, no, we do have. But if the market funds, better. That, that's one of the, one part of our equation. And the second part is all the SME. And then there's on SME where we are credit agnostic. Everyone in Brazil that's uh, below uh, $60 million of revenues per year, it's our client, direct and direct, and we try to serve those, the, those, those, those uh, entrepreneurs. Because again, trying to address this uh, credit spread. To be honest, Sabatin, that's something that uh, the bank has been doing before my tenure. So since 17, that's been happening in the bank. Well, we're just speeding up this agenda. Okay. Um, there's another question here, which is, uh, it, Brazil's been in the news recently because of uh, challenges to the environment, uh, often linked with uh, agricultural development um, in, in, in the Amazon in particular. Um, to what extent is BNDS trying to offer incentives, credit and the like to create a better pathway 
for uh, more sustainable agriculture and development in Brazil? And to what extent, that, they mentioned this, is, can this hurt uh, Brazil's chances or Mercosur's chances with um, a trade deal with the EU? Which is obviously a little bit out of your field, but I'm curious what your thoughts are. No, thank you for this question. And uh, before I speak about BNDS, let's, let's, let, let me make a more conceptual comment. And when we look about the environment and how to deal with environment, and I mentioned, I, mean, I, mentioned, I would say sustainable environment, uh, you, you should look that in a long-term view, right? Environment, um, nature first, is not a, a short-term trade or short-term investments. You should look at 20, 34 years window and trying to judge Brazil if it's a good or bad uh, a manager of uh, environmental assets uh, uh, in a two years window, I would say that's completely misleading, right? And if you look at long-term window, 40 years, 50 years, 100, window, 100 years, uh, we are likely the country in the world that knows better how to deal with environment. We have 60% of our land, of our territory, is still of uh, forests. Uh, only 80% of our land is used for agriculture. And we are this international massive agri powerhouse using only 80% of our land. So um, naturally, there is a lot of uh, competition and uh, 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 trying to, to position Brazil as a bad guy. But if you look at the long-term window and look at our, our dynamics of agriculture and how Brazilian people, how they live, I would say that, that we are likely, likely, I'm not a firm, but I'll be like, delighted to be challenged. We are likely the most sustainable country in the world. Our big challenge for sustainability is again the poverty, because we cannot take, take care of the environment without forgetting the people. That's our biggest challenge. When you look at the nature itself and the, the ways of production, uh, we know how to do that. We know how to do that. And uh, we need to, again, to invent and create tools where the entrepreneurs the private market in Brazil, they are remunerated and they can fund people living in the in the forest regions in order to preserve uh, even more even more uh, 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 the environment, and that's a mission critical for BNDS. BNDS has been has been uh, 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 working on this for 30 years. We are likely the first bank in Brazil that had uh, founded a, a sustainable department was in the 80s. So the bank has a huge huge uh, uh, intellectual property on this agenda in Brazil. And uh, as it's public, you know, we're also the manager of the Amazon fund that invested uh, roughly uh, 1 billion, 1 billion reais in the last uh, 10 years in Brazil. So we learned a lot. And uh, it's a critical agenda for us, trying to, to push the market, trying to push the company, the players, uh, the private players in Brazil to, to make uh, a, a sustainable exploration, financial exploration of the, of the green assets. Uh, that's why, Sabatini, we put up a place, a desk in the bank where we cover private companies, but not, not for credit. We are covering today 200 large companies in Brazil, and I'd like to finish uh, next year with 300 uh, with uh, a group of people, bankers, that they sell ESG products for the, for the private players, trying to find what are their social and environmental goals and using that in our machine to create products to alongside with them, finance those green assets and social and social actions. So it's a kind of ESG bank for the private sector, not through funding but providing services. And uh, it will be a critical it will be a critical mission for 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 the agenda of BNDS going forward. And as I said before, I do think we have all the tools and all the features to lead the green finance technology worldwide, because there is there is a lot of things that come from Europe or US that they, they just don't apply to Brazil. They just don't apply. It's not applicable. And uh, 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 trying to, comp to compare development counts that already burned all their forests, sorry for the, the direct word, with emerging market country with a lot of poverty that he still has 60% of its land on forest is, is not the same word. And uh, for those that didn't have the opportunity, I do invite you to go to the Amazon and visit there or the Pantanal. It's a totally different world, and just not the forest, but see how the people live. It's a different mindset, it's a different gravity, basically. So it's hard just to explain. But uh, I do see that as a big opportunity for, for Brazil, I do see. And uh, when, I, when I see the mindset 
that has changed in the private sector in the last two, two years, I get very optimistic, very, very optimistic. But this, because the solution will not, will not come from the government. The solution will come from the private sector. And uh, maybe I'm biased, but I do think that the financial agents, the, our Brazilian Wall Street, has a critical mission to, to play their critical mission. Yeah, and of course, as you say, the incentives that the financial sector provides to the private sector to engage in more sustainable agriculture. And I think also a Chatham House field trip to the Amazon is something many of us would be signing up for as soon as oh, we great. can. Uh, we have two questions. So I just uh, want to say, one, can I just say one thing to one Yes, please. Gustavo, you're paying carbon credits of 32 euros. Remember when we first in started your... looking at them at seven, right? Yeah. I remember. But, but Hugh, your, your, your carbon credit is trading $40, $40, in Europe. If you go to Brazil, it's $4. Because <laughs> Europeans, they just don't accept the carbon market, the carbon credits from Brazil for all their uh, Paris agreements, stuff, etc. But they're they just, just not linked. And more than that, more than that, uh, I'm not an environmental specialist, but uh, standing forest doesn't account for carbon credit. Yeah. Just the avoidance of deforestation. So we have a large green asset, large green asset, but just, just standing the asset value zero. So we need doesn't to find a sense. way of, uh, yeah. of when it doesn't make sense. We need to find a, a way of remunerating that. And uh, when, I, when I say remunerating here, and I'm speaking about little money, uh, Sabatini, little money. Let me just give you a reference, a reference of, uh, of scale, of notionals that we're speaking here. If you, if you see all the, the polemic behind the Amazon fund that you're, that you're seeing in the news, uh, it's, a, it, it's a, a, a big learning process for the bank, uh, a useful tool that we can uh, uh, retake on the, on, on, on the future in, in proper terms, in proper, I would say, political and governance terms, if, uh, if changed. But uh, uh, on average, in the last 11 years, the Amazon fund has disbursed $20 million. $20 million, about in per year. And when we discuss about the Amazon and all this stuff, I think we should be thinking about billion dollars, right? And uh, then, but the notions of the people that, that live there, we have 23 million Brazilians live there, it's time. I'm speaking about little money, you see? And I think that with small actions, but well-prepared, well-modeled, uh, we can we can really change the things there. It, we don't need uh, uh, big checks. But on the other hand, when I speak with blue ship guys in Brazil or, or or worldwide, oh, let's come to the Amazon, do a factor there, create a center, let's finance some standing forwards. Oh, I cannot step there because of uh, because of reputational risk. So it's a conundrum. It's a yeah. conundrum. But I do okay. think uh, when you solve a conundrum, it's like finding the button. When you find the button, all the rocks they move right. And uh, I do think that we're, we're close to this, and I, I do count on my Wall Street Brazilian friends to, to help us there. Uh, we have a number of questions, but we are almost out of time. I want to, Steve Cooney had a question that's on the issue of the environment. I don't know, Steve, whether you can, we'll try to unmute you here. Okay, well, my, my, my question was, is that uh, I was uh, very, I uh, spent some time in the, in, in the, in the early 2000s uh, visiting uh, with the Brazilian steel industry. I worked at the Library of Congress and we did some research on um, the Brazilian steel industry. And I just wondered how, uh, and, and Bindes had was involved in some major projects there. Uh, but I'm wondering now how that has evolved uh, and also in particular, how it, how it, how the, the Binday's projects uh, have, there were some very interesting projects involving uh, different types of, um, of, of, of material for fuel. And I'm just wondering how those projects have developed and how they're being developed by Binday's. Yeah, both the, the steel and, uh, and iron ore industries of today, uh, they are quite, quite big boys in Brazil, most of them US funded. So they basically don't need BNDS much. If uh, you, you see the additional capital that we provide to them, it's not something material. However, however, a big agenda that we have with some with some industry and somehow iron ore is over there is the gas, right? We have a big pre-salt reserve uh, of oil that comes with gas. So it's a, it's a environmental clean to take this gas. It comes along with oil, it's just not gas. That can really change the dynamics of uh, supplying energy to some uh, 
to some uh, steel and iron ore producers in Brazil. That's a big agenda, but from the gas side. On their incumbent business, they basically can be funded on better terms elsewhere. Thank you very much, uh, Gustavo. Uh, I think all of you can see why uh, Gustavo, as he said, at the ripe old age of 37, uh, became, like, I'm, I'm an adventure guest here, the youngest president ever of BNDS. Um, no, no, I check it, I'm not. No, oh, well, <laughs> now I'm even more envious, actually. The, uh, um, so, the, uh, um, but obviously, you know, he's taken one of the most, uh, uh, the largest development bank that many people don't know, uh, one that was caught up in a number of scandals and, and mismanagement and has completely turned it around and still in the process of doing that and doing it in a very important time in Brazil, not just because of COVID, but also coming out of the recession. And you can see that he has a very clear idea of his market principles uh, to do so, and uh, a very clear idea also of the environmental uh, demands uh, of doing so. And so I think it's, it's, it's enlightening and important that we hear these voices. And I really want to thank you, Gustavo, and I hope to host you here. And what you said was your favorite, uh, one of your favorite places, London, in person uh, when we can. Uh, and someday maybe we'll even host uh, you in, in Brazil uh, as Chatham House if we were to have our future conference in Brazil there as well. Um, I want to thank our Latin American Initiative funders, HSBC, BTG Pactuel, represented here ably by Hugh Jenkins, uh, Diageo, Fresnio, B, um, Wintershell, DEA, uh, Karen Energy, and uh, Equinor. Uh, and I want to thank all of you for attending. I want to thank Hugh for his comments and for mentoring a very capable future president of BNDS. Uh, and I want to wish you all to quote Boris Johnson, a merry little Christmas. Emphasis on the little, as he said yesterday because of COVID. So please, happy holidays, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us. Thank you, Gustavo. Keep up the good work. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Bye -bye.